Anansi and the Pot of Wisdom Long ago, at the beginning of the world, people could not solve their own problems. Nyame, the sky god, looked down and felt sorry for humans. He said, I will send wisdom to the people, then they can solve problems. Anansi, the clever spider, overheard Nyame's plan. He climbed to the top of the tree and said to Nyame, That is a good idea. Give the wisdom to me, and I will take it down to the people. Nyame knew the spider was clever, but he also knew that the people sorely needed wisdom more than anything else. He agreed with Anansi's plan. Nyame poured his wisdom into a big clay pot and gave it to Anansi. This wisdom is more valuable than gold or silver, said Nyame. Take this to the people so that they can solve their problems. Anansi scurried back down to earth with the pot and looked inside. It was full of wonderful ideas and skills. I will use this wisdom first, he said to himself. Then I will give it to the people. Each day, Anansi opened the pot and learned new things. After many days, Anansi said greedily, This wisdom is too valuable to share. I must keep it to myself. He decided to hide it at the top of the tall tree where no human could climb. But how could he carry such a heavy pot up the tree? Anansi held the pot in front of him with his front two legs while the others struggled to climb the tree. He wrestled the pot up, but not seeing where he was going, he would hit another branch and slide back down. His young son, Ntikuma, saw his father's struggle. Father, the boy said, if you tie the pot to your back, it'll be easier for you to hold on to the tree and climb. Anansi followed his son's advice and tied the pot to his back with some strong vines. The rest of the climb was easier. When he got to the top, he looked down on his son, and his pride turned to anger. What a fool I am. I have the pot of wisdom, yet a little boy had more common sense than I did. What use is all of this wisdom to me? Anansi angrily threw the pot to the ground where it smashed into a million pieces. The great wind scattered the wisdom all over the world. People found bits of the wisdom here or there and took them home to share with their families. That is why no one person has all of the wisdom in the world and why we share wisdom with each other when we exchange ideas. Welcome to The Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. We all sometimes fall into the trap of being a bit like the clever Anansi. We can be full of ourselves and quickly dismiss a presentation of occult disease that is just right there in front of us. Being clever is not the same as being wise. Today I want to talk with you about a no-miss diagnosis for us, myocarditis. Being clever will not make this diagnosis, but being knowledgeable about this trickster of a disease will help us the most. Let's start with how myocarditis can be a pretty good trickster itself. The presentation is elusive. It's subtle and deceiving. Myocarditis may look just like a viral syndrome or influenza-like illness or pneumonia or even acute gastroenteritis. What's worse is that children are often brought in very early on in the disease process and no diagnostician, however legendary, would have been able to make the diagnosis at that point. Or we may see a child in the middle of his disease, but the past two clinicians have labeled him to 
have a virus or influenza. And sure, why not? Let's stay the course, mom and dad, and just stay home. The availability heuristic comes into play. The mental shortcuts we use all of the time to make snap judgment on the little bits of info that we have. Or an anchoring bias weighs us down. Someone very smart thought that it was viral. Sure, it looks viral. You know what? It's viral. As we slip further and further down the tree. Until you take a moment, and this is crucial in the approach to any elusive diagnosis, and especially here with myocarditis, until you take a moment to ask yourself, is there something that just doesn't fit? Why is the toddler sicker than what I would have thought of for viral syndrome? Why is the school-age child so ill-appearing for gastroenteritis? Here's a useful cognitive construct for high-risk, low-frequency conditions. The idea of signal underneath the noise. We lead busy clinical lives. We're bombarded with information. Mass quantities of data, all of varying quality. We are forever making little decisions on how much weight to place on this or that, any given information that's just thrown at us. It's not about all of that. It's about detecting that little blip of a signal. The red flag that can be glossed over. Listening for that faint echo of truth in the wall of sound that is our emergency department. Today we'll talk about three cases to illustrate how to detect that signal. A two-and-a-half-year-old girl with vomiting and dehydration. Could be anything. A 12-year-old boy with cough, dyspnea, and vomiting, like everyone else in the waiting room. A 13-year-old girl with dizziness, chest pain, and palpitations, like almost everyone her age. Before we go further, let's learn the signals that we're looking for. Friedman et al. in pediatrics did a chart review of known cases of myocarditis and cataloged all of the typical things we would think of. Some highlights of this research are that the vast majority will have some respiratory finding in myocarditis, only half will present tachycardic, and the minority will have specific findings of heart failure that we look for, hepatomegaly or hypotension. This is my takeaway from the review of the literature. An age-based symptomatology will help us more than anything else. For infants and toddlers, look for fussiness, poor feeding, or fever. Again, all of these are vague, nonspecific signs or symptoms, but the key here is that we're going for sensitivity. And more importantly, you're looking for fussiness, fever, and poor feeding that is out of proportion to what you would normally expect to see for the benign diagnosis that you kind of want to make. For preschool and school-age children, look for cough or abdominal pain. Again, those can be anything, and I'm not advocating overdiagnosis. But think of it this way. If a sick child comes in complaining of cough or belly pain, Without tenderness to palpation, and your availability heuristic kicks in, or you're anchored by bias, think again. Don't make the child fit into a preconceived benign illness. Even though the sign or symptom is more commonly something benign, the signal underneath will be the disproportionate nature of it all. For teens and young adults, you can start looking for more typical chest symptoms, such as chest pain, palpitations, or even syncope. Again, the key is to be open to the possibility of myocarditis so that when the young adult or adolescent looks sicker than he or she should, or is suffering more than you would expect, or it just doesn't match what you're expecting, it's okay. It doesn't have to. Myocarditis doesn't play fair. Looking at the Friedman data, here is how I'm going to keep it simple. For those less than 10 years of age, 
respiratory and GI symptoms predominate. For those older than 10, look for more cardiac symptoms. All of these will be out of proportion to the benign diagnosis you want to give them. Clara is a two and a half year old girl who has had increasing vomiting for the past three days. Mother has been hard at work trying to get her to keep down anything easy to digest. Clara had a tactile fever on the first day, but has felt more clammy since. Today, she just would not seem to stay awake enough to eat. On review of systems, there's some cough, especially after she vomits, no diarrhea, no particular belly pain. Clara was born full term. She's vaccinated. She has no past medical history. It's a busy shift. You see Clara and the family only briefly before you're pulled away for a critical run. In the interest of expediency, you ask the nurse to put in a line, draw some baseline labs because of her volume depletion. She just doesn't look that great to you. Uh, start a normal saline bolus. Her BUN is 38.2 milligrams per deciliter. Her creatinine is 6.9. Renal failure. Why? Luckily, you added some more belly labs in there. The lipase is okay. The alkaline phosphatase is up, but that's okay. She's growing. Her AST is 444. Um, well, cough in these labs. Um, I don't know, but I guess, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Hello, Dr. Smith. Uh, yes, I have Clara here to admit to you for pneumonia and renal failure. Now, what was the signal? And what was the noise? All of the vague symptoms taken vase value were a lot of noise. What was the signal underneath it all? Vomiting for three days and no diarrhea. No acute gastroenteritis, at least not yet. Cough? Really? She may have coughed once or twice over the past three days. She definitely has pre-renal azotemia, but why? All of this information does not help you to see the signal. Her lethargy and volume depletion is out of proportion to what you would expect for the most handy and available diagnosis. Did you catch the liver function tests? Clara's AST was 444. Since myocarditis is a clinical diagnosis, and it's a hard one to establish, it only makes sense that we would want a lab test to confirm it. I'm sorry to tell you that no single test can rule in or rule out myocarditis, but some are more reliably positive and consistent with a diagnosis. Let's go from the least helpful lab test to the most helpful for myocarditis. CRP or ESR, they are markers of inflammation, so they should be... Po oh, no, the sensitivity is only 50%. Okay, well, uh, how about troponin? This is a problem with the heart, right? So the sensitivity is only 71%. Brain natriuretic peptide, come on, the right atrium is stressed out and stretched, and the sensitivity is only 70%. Not great. The most sensitive test for myocarditis in children is the AST, with a sensitivity of 85%. Still not stellar, but I'll take it. Why would a liver function test be helpful? Hepatic con... Hepatic congest... Hepatic congestion. Back in the day to diagnose MI, for example, in adults, before fancy troponin or even the now outdated CKMB, all we had were liver function tests. Luckily or unluckily, children will have functional impairment of contractility causing hepatic congestion before biochemical evidence of injury. Liam is a 12-year-old boy with two days of cough, now with dyspnea 
and vomiting that started today. He had some reactive airway disease as a toddler, but no other medical problems. He's up to date on his vaccinations. His mother is a nurse who made sure that he got his flu shot. Mom thinks it's the flu regardless since everyone else in the house has it. On exam, Liam is uncomfortable in mild to moderate respiratory distress. The bronchodilator just seems to make his heart rate increase. He is dehydrated and mildly ill, so you rehydrate him and check some labs. BUN 65.4, creatinine 2, AST 1,999. He's tachycardic, so he gets some fluid. He becomes bradycardic, so uh, you uh, give him some atropine. You get a chest x-ray and you feel like you're flailing for an answer. He has cardiomegaly. So you slow down the fluids. Whatever you do to him, it seems like you're just making it worse. You call upstairs and the best impression you can give is influenza. But wait. A lot of noise. Some anchoring. Influenza may look a lot like this, but tachycardia alternating with bradycardia? What? And then there is our new friend, the AST. You can see how myocarditis can blindside us. Okay, another pearl to know. In myocarditis, unfortunately, you'll see cardiomegaly only 60% of the time. However, there will be some abnormality on the chest x-ray. Cardiomegaly, pulmonary congestion, effusion, fluid in the fissure, something up to 90% of the time. Get that chest x-ray to help find out what's going on. Sarah is a 13-year-old girl whose teacher called EMS because she was dizzy and having palpitations. On arrival, the medics report no trauma and they allude to a Level 1 drama activation. When you ask for the vitals in the field, they report a heart rate of, oh, it was 40, Doc, uh, BP 160. Here, her heart rate is 80 and her blood pressure is 110 over 70. She looks tired. She has been feeling fatigued for the past day or two with body aches, and she didn't want to miss the school trip today, so she pushed through. There definitely is a bit of a colorful interaction between her and her family. All very nice, pleasant people. You're a bit stumped. You know what? She seems okay now. I don't know what to do. She is a little dramatic. Diagnosis? Can't even. Or is it that you can't even make a diagnosis? You do feel stumped. If this was just a vasovagal issue, then why was her heart rate and blood pressure still low on EMS arrival? The response time was eight minutes. Vasovagal reactions are brief and self-limiting. Hmm, symptoms out of proportion to the benign diagnosis that you want to make? The signal is the vital signs. Luckily, the medics left their rhythm strip from the field. Oh... Her P waves march out nicely to the tune of 100 beats per minute. Her QRS complexes are regular too, but the rate is more like, yep, 40 beats per minute. They are a little bizarre looking too. Not wide per se, not longer than 120 milliseconds, but there is some odd morphology to them consistent with a conduction delay. Near syncope, bradycardia, AV dissociation in the setting of flu-like illness. Hmm, what could that be? This brings us to the use of EKG in myocarditis. Spoiler alert, it's not that exciting. According to Levine et al. in 2010, the STT wave changes are the most common finding, but only in about 60% of cases. 
Sinus tachycardia in 46%. So that's pretty lame. Uh, you may also see things like axis deviation, but of course that could be a normal variant in children or an infarction pattern. Okay, nobody should have this. Uh, you may also just see a decreased voltage. Nothing is too consistent. Again, the diagnosis of myocarditis is clinical. If you find an EKG abnormality, you should address it, but it may not be present at the time that you see the child. Tests may support the diagnosis, but they don't make it. <laughs> Okay, Tim, we get it. It's a tough diagnosis to make. When we do make the diagnosis, what do we do about it? All right, let's talk about treatment, and then we'll circle back to our cases and do our best to take good care of them. First, as you know, the treatment really is supportive. But that doesn't mean walk away and do nothing. Assertively diagnosing and aggressively addressing any hemodynamic perturbation will help keep your child out of trouble. Myocarditis can kill. Your young patient's hemodynamics may seem stable at that moment, but he can tank the next moment. Remember, children compensate very well until they precipitously fall off the compensation cliff. So what do we do to assess and address pediatric hemodynamics in impending cardiogenic shock? I'm glad you asked. Let's use the Forrester classification of cardiogenic shock. It's simply a four-square table. On one side, congestion, yes or no, and the other side, hypoperfusion, yes or no. The top left square shows no pulmonary congestion and no hypoperfusion. So that means that the child is warm and dry. Great. That is where we want people. Good perfusion to the extremities and no evidence of cardiopulmonary congestion, no evidence of heart failure, warm and dry. The mortality for these patients is less than 3%. Moving over, we have the top right square, warm and now wet. So good peripheral perfusion, but with evidence of pulmonary congestion. Warm and wet patients are typically stable because they are compensating well for their overload. The mortality here for sick children is less than 10%. Moving down to the lower left, we have the combination of cardiogenic shock that is cold and dry. So the pulmonary circuit is not overloaded, but the cardiac output is insufficient to provide adequate perfusion. These patients will also have poor renal function and poor perfusion. Mortality is increasing. And lastly, our sickest combination of cardiogenic shock is in the lower right corner, cold and wet. These patients are congested, the heart is stunned, the cardiac output is terrible, so you get poor perfusion, poor squeeze, overload. All of this sets the mortality of these patients skyrocketing. The reason for using the Forrester categorization is to drive management. The idea is to help the patient compensate for the physiology that he's lacking, to support where his hemodynamics are falling over. For warm and dry patients, just don't mess them up. These are the stable unicorns that you're probably not going to see in the emergency department because they're not going to have any symptoms and they live their nice lives away from you. If you see a patient with, say, chronic heart failure who is warm and dry, steady there, my friend. Going further, let's loop back to our patients and see if we can categorize and treat them well. 
Clara is our two and a half year old girl with vomiting and dehydration that was miscalled pneumonia and renal failure. She had clear lungs, but was cold and clammy. The admitting team is anchored on our misdiagnosis, and so she gets fluid bolus after fluid bolus. Nine hours after admission, Clara has ventricular tachycardia. So what's the cure for a sick patient? Transfer. She's now transferred to you. She's not intubated. She's in shock. You try to stabilize her. You attempt intubation. You're successful, but she has a cardiac arrest from cardiovascular collapse. After a long code, you're unable to obtain a return of spontaneous circulation. On autopsy, they find acute fulminant myocarditis, but they're unable to isolate a virus. Poor Clara was an enigma, and no amount of second-guessing would be fair. But let's look a little deeper into some opportunities for improvement. For Clara, she was cold and dry when she arrived. This is the pitfall. It's natural to think that She would need fluids, fluids, fluids. In fact, she needs two things before fluids. She needs an inotrope and a presser to support her. Only then she may get gentle fluids. Dobutamine is an inotrope that acts on beta-1 receptors to increase contractility and heart rate. Its activity on alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors, however, will cause some peripheral vasodilation. In someone with a shock state, especially in a child who relies on peripheral vascular tone to meet his perfusion needs, this vasodilation can be enough to cause cardiac arrest. The safest thing to do is to start a vasopressor first, like norepinephrine, with its alpha effects that will outweigh its beta effects. Once the systemic vasculature is supported with a vasopressor, like norepinephrine, Forward flow can be further improved with dobutamine, the inotrope. Nor epi for SVR support, dobutamine for forward flow. That is probably all you need in the cold and dry patient. Remember, dry in cardiogenic shock refers to the cardiopulmonary compartment. There is no inherent need for fluids. If, after the presser and after the inotrope, maybe you need a small amount of fluid, great. Otherwise, proceed with caution. Liam is our 12-year-old boy with respiratory distress and vomiting. He had some crackles about a quarter of the way up the lung fields, but good capillary refill. He was diagnosed with influenza and admitted for his O2 requirement. Luckily, the inpatient team realized that his signs and symptoms were out of proportion to the proposed diagnosis. Unfortunately, they were also a little too aggressive with the diuretics, and 10 hours later, he became hypotensive with frequent PVCs. A presumptive diagnosis of myocarditis was made at that point. They started him on a presser and an inotrope. Later, his echocardiogram showed biventricular enlargement, ejection fraction 10%. Unfortunately, he needed veno-arterial ECMO for a few weeks. His biopsy confirmed myocarditis and macrophage activation syndrome, an excessive activation of lymphocytes and macrophages that cause a type of immunologic multi-organ system failure. But because of the careful and aggressive care that Liam got, and really a quick change in mindset of his clinicians, 18 months later, he had a full recovery and a normal EF. Liam was warm and wet, So what he really needed was a little positive pressure ventilation, some gentle, gentle diuretics as needed. He may have decompensated regardless, but it's good to keep in mind what our goals of treatment are and how to get there carefully. (laughs) 
Sarah is our 13-year-old girl with dizziness palpitations, found to be bradycardic in the field, later to be recognized as a high-degree AV block. She later on in the ED course became clammy, even cold, with respiratory distress. Her chest x-ray was normal initially when she came in, but her exam changed right in front of the ED staff. She was intubated for precipitous course. She had a run of ventricular tachycardia. Her pulmonary edema improved with positive pressure ventilation. Her poor perfusion improved with norepinephrine for SVR support and dobutamine for forward flow. Sarah also upstairs received some IVIG at some point in her course, uh, which has less of an evidence basis, but it can be considered for severe cases. It was remarkable how sick she got and how fast it happened. She could have easily been discharged earlier when she was only mildly symptomatic, but her signs and symptoms were even initially out of proportion to the proposed benign diagnosis. And now you see a theme here. Sarah was cold and wet, so she needed positive pressure ventilation as well as hemodynamic support. To recap, Myocarditis is elusive and can be subtle, but the signs and symptoms are usually out of proportion to the proposed benign diagnosis that you want to make. Find that echo of truth, that signal under all of the noise. Infants and toddlers are fussy, have poor feeding, and have fever, out of proportion to what you would expect. Preschool and school-age children may present with cough or abdominal pain out of proportion to what you would expect. And adolescents and young adults begin to have more typical chest symptoms out of proportion. Myocarditis is a clinical diagnosis, but sometimes an AST here can help, a chest x-ray there, or maybe even point-of-care ultrasound. Warm and dry? Don't mess them up. Warm and wet. Gentle diuretics, plus or minus positive pressure ventilation. Cold and dry. A presser, an inotrope, and maybe later on, gentle fluids. Cold and wet. A presser, inotrope, and positive pressure ventilation. If you're wet, in other words, congested in your cardiopulmonary compartment, you need some positive pressure ventilation. Maybe that's non-invasive. Maybe that's endotracheal intubation. If you're cold, poor perfusion, you'll need norepinephrine for peripheral vascular support and dobutamine for forward flow. Early cardiopulmonary support is critical. Think of it like a reverse sepsis. Instead of fluids, 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 and then a presser, in myocarditis, start the presser first, inotrope for forward flow, and only later, 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 consider some volume enhancement. You can do this. You have the pot of wisdom now. Open it up and share it with others. Anansi would be pleased. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there. See you there.